The Climate Solutions Meeting the Challenge Speaker Series is an informal coalition of local organizations that have come together due to their common belief that solving the climate crisis is the most important challenge of our times and critical for the survival of all life on this planet. The coalition has recently expanded from six organizations to eight, including Concord CAN, the League of Women Voters of Concord and Carlisle, First Parish and Concord, Mothers Out Front, Musketaquid Arts and Environment, Trinitarian Congregational Church, Trinity Episcopal Church, and the West Concord Union Church. I'm going to turn over the microphone to Rebecca Woodward from Mothers Out Front, and she's going to introduce the speakers and sets the context. Hello, everyone. It's really wonderful that we actually had to pull out new chairs. So thank you so much. Um, it's wonderful to see you uh, here tonight. I'm actually just going to say a few words, and then I'll do the introductions of the speakers and turn it over to them. 98% about that of climate scientists agree that it is our use of fossil fuels that are dangerously warming the planet. That is related to how we live. It has to do with the way we fuel and heat our homes. It has to do with our transportation. It has to do with our food production. We know that unless we take very clear and bold action, these dangerous emissions put us, and especially our children, all children and all life, at great risk. 2015 was already the warmest year of uh, uh, ever, and 2016 is, has every reason uh, for us to expect that to be the same. The question is, what can we do about it? It's easy. Day-to-day -day life can be consu so consuming. There are a million things for us to take care of. It's easy for us to get caught up in the things that feel more pressing, that seem like they need our attention more. But nothing is more important than us taking action, bold, clear, collective action, to address this real threat to our children, all children, and all life. The good news is that we have lots of reasons to be hopeful. It's just tremendous, the examples that exist out there, showing us that different pathways are possible and that it is in our power to address this huge challenge, the challenger of our time. One of those examples comes from Cambridge, Massachusetts, but Cambridge is just one of many towns and communities that are showing that this kind of strategic planning to come together collectively to agree that this is the most important thing does make a difference and does set us on a different path. And we know that our current action whether it's behavioral change, relying on individual behavioral change, or isolated sustainability projects, is not going to get us to our sustainability goals. So we are so pleased tonight to have Henrietta Davis and Quentin Zondervan join us. Please join me in welcoming Henrietta and Quentin. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening. I start off this part of the presentation by giving you some of the background of the process uh, that went on in Cambridge. Um, I'm here with the hope, and Quinton is he also, of inspiring you to do what we've done in our community and, uh, and decide to do something really serious about cutting carbon. Um, I was in, both Quinton and I were fortunate enough to be in Paris during the climate talks. And um, I was there especially to find out about cities, because you may know that, uh, that Mayor Bloomberg and the mayor of Paris, Anne Hidalgo, were really focusing on how cities have a role in cutting carbon. Uh, there were 400 cities worldwide that were represented, 140 uh, from the US. And uh, the mayor of Paris started off by saying, we're here because 50% of the carbon emissions emanate from cities and towns. And 70% of the people live there. And we have a huge role to play in cutting carbon emissions. So that's, I think, what the message that we felt in our city just by ourselves, that we had a role to play. That we had a role to play not only in understanding what our emissions were and what could be done about it, but also in modeling what could be done elsewhere. 
Uh, we've been very fortunate as, as a city to have years of support for environmental work uh, that's been very meaningful and uh, we take it as part of our job to try to share uh, what we've done and hope we'll get you all charged up, so to speak, uh, to, do, uh, to do quite a lot. <clears throat> uh, the first thing I want to tell you about is about how, what Cambridge is as a green city. Now we're, I think, I bet you have joined the Green Communities Act. We were number two after Newton. We were very disappointed that we didn't, we weren't number one. Uh, we set asp the aspirational goal of having all our new schools built as net zero schools, and we have one school that just opened that's a near net zero school. We've adopted the Building Energy Disclosure Ordinance so that we are going to be able to, uh, to see uh, how, how much energy large buildings in our community are using and that that information will be transparent, uh, will become part of the economic decision of people as they decide which building to rent or to buy. Um, we, have, uh, we have the Energy Alliance, which is an internal organization in the city to help people to find energy efficiency. Uh, we're, we're doing a vulnerability assessment and, um, and so on and so forth. I'm not sure I have the mic in the right no, place. No, you do. I'm going to lower it. Please. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, one of the things that's really important to know about Cambridge and is important to know about your community also is where do your carbon emissions come from? And if I had slides, this would be the one slide I would show you, which is that, car that Cambridge's carbon emissions come 70 to 80 percent from buildings. Most of those are commercial buildings, large commercial buildings. We have a tiny little sliver that's waste, and 20% is transportation, because we have a lot of um, uh, very good public transportation system. But if we wanted to uh, have an impact on our carbon emissions overall, we really needed to look at buildings, and that's, that's part of how we got to where we were. Um, a little over two years ago, <clears throat> there was a, a major zoning proposal for rezoning Kendall Square for MIT development. And uh, there was a lot of uh, consternation in the community about all this new building for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons was because as we were trying to reduce our carbon emissions in the city, here there was more building going on. How are we going to handle that? And uh, the, the citizen, there was a citizen petition that asked that we require that all the new buildings that were built in Kendall Square and maybe throughout the city throughout the city, be net zero. Well, you can imagine what some people thought about that idea. Uh, requiring that cities be net, that, that buildings be net zero when there was, there is one uh, high rise building, I think it's in Washington state, uh, that is net zero. How could we, uh, Little Cambridge, because although we're bigger than Concord, we're only 100,000, 105,000, how could we have this requirement? So uh, as is typical with kind of legislative bodies, what we did is we referred it to a committee, right? <laughs> Have you ever done that? Um, so, but the difference here was it was done with real sincerity and with a deep commitment to getting, having this committee work. Uh, there was an allocation made for a consultant. Uh, the consultant was integra Integral from Vancouver, Canada. Uh, they have a lot of experience in Vancouver and, and other Canadian cities, too, with these issues around energy. Uh, we had a task force of 15 people who were drawn from every sector in the city, uh, from the citizens, uh, from uh, the municipal sector, uh, from uh, sol people who worked in solar, people who worked in energy efficiency, uh, and the affected parties also. In our case, that meant uh, Harvard and MIT and some of the biotech developers, they were all a part of this committee. The committee met for, was supposed to meet for a year, and I heard people apologizing because it met for 13 months. I guess they thought somehow that was terrible. But uh, <laughs> I think 13 months was pretty good. And um, uh, over the course of that time, we took on understanding our city. You know, and I think that's the first thing that any community that's going to take on this net zero emissions goal has to do is to know what, what are the emissions in your community and, and what, uh, who are the people that essentially own those emissions. You really need to understand uh, what's going on in your community and then from there uh, define what net zero means to you. Now, uh, I'm going to read you our definition because this took us months to figure out what we meant. Uh, because it wasn't, it, net zero 
lots of people said, well, that should be, that should include transportation, that should include just the buildings that are in this one part of town, that's this or that. But the ultimate definition was about buildings only uh, because of the importance of buildings in our emissions profile. Also because of the control that you have, that we have as a city over buildings because regulating buildings, building construction is largely a local matter. Um, it's something that um, although there are state codes, the state building code, you know you can adopt the stretch code, you can go further, you can go further with your zoning, you have a lot of local, uh, local power. So here is our definition. The task force defines net zero with respect to the city as a whole as a community of buildings for which on an annual basis all greenhouse gas emissions produced through building operations are offset by carbon-free energy production. Achieving the net zero objective relies on a combination of energy efficiency improvements, renewable energy production, and where necessary, purchase of carbon offsets or potentially credits. This took fully three months to develop. So you may find in your community also that the definition of what matters to you and what needs to be net zero, you need to spend some time on that. Partly because your community needs to understand what it is you're driving at. And uh, as a whole, people need, need to be a part of that goal. They, they can't think, well, they didn't do that. Well, they didn't do this piece, or that wasn't important. There needs to be really full, full support of that. And I think that through batting this around for months and months, uh, we managed to get there. The other thing we did, uh, we had several task forces. Underneath our task force, there were about four working groups, I think. And I was in the, uh, uh, in the energy, um, renewable energy working group, which uh, was extremely um, uh, interesting because I think we all thought we knew the answers and yet when we started doing our analysis of what was, for example, the solar potential in Cambridge, we learned that it was remarkably less than we thought at first. Uh, that uh, we, had, we had a solar map of the city that uh, showed some very, uh, might have had smiley faces on the rooftops, it was so positive, uh, saying, you know, all, the, all this solar is possible, we can have it all. But when uh, one of our, the members of our committee, uh, Paul Lyons, who's a, a solar consultant, had somebody who was working in his office actually look into it, he found that there were technical problems for many, many of those roofs, and that actually the rooftop potential of our city was only 11% of all those roofs were ever going to be possible for solar. So we have, we are very uh, landlocked. Your community is really different. You have a lot of land and you have the possibility of putting solar on, um, on open space, something we have, you know, about this much chance of doing. I mean, there's some, but it's very, very small. So again, once again, knowing your community and knowing the specifics of your community is terribly important. Um, we, we came up with five strategies that we wanted to use. Uh, and this took a while also because we generated 140 ideas, I think. Uh, there were, everybody got a chance to put all their stickies up all over the wall and everything. And there were these 140 ideas. And in the end, they all coalesced around five things. Energy efficiency in new buildings. And those, you know, we have quite a lot of control over through zoning because we can require a lead standard um, in, in our zoning, in our local zoning. Energy efficiency in existing buildings, very, very difficult, but absolutely important to do. Um, and that's something that we will roll out in time. We looked at energy supply, that is uh, increasing the supply of, renewable, of renewables. That was number three. Number four was developing a local carbon fund to fund some of these initiatives. And that is sort of a little bit to be determined exactly what that's going to be. Uh, many of us in uh, sitting around the room with some Harvard representatives thought, how about you, Harvard? You have, a, you have a, Harvard has a really stringent uh, goals for their carbon reduction, and they're not going to be able to um, achieve all of that on, on the Harvard campus. So we thought maybe they would like to invest in some of our local tree planting. Uh, in our community. Maybe they would like to invest in some energy efficiency projects uh, in low-income uh, households. 
so that's the kind of thing we were thinking of. And the fifth strategy is engagement. That is reaching out to the community in, um, in many different ways. So uh, things are already beginning to start, to roll. Uh, we're, we have uh, the Net Zero Building Initiative uh, begins with the municipal buildings. Everything we've done in Cambridge that's been green has started with the city doing it itself and modeling best practice. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, the net zero, the second net zero school, or the net second try at a net zero school, is under construction, uh, under design right now. And um, these are not easy things to do, these net zero buildings, but there are more and more of them proliferating around the country and around the world. In our case, I happened to talk to the deputy city manager about putting together the contract for uh, this, this is the King Open building on Cambridge Street, um, has a lot of land, so that should help it. But um, <clears throat> she said that the, the neighbors want to put a pool in there, and I said, oh my god. You know, how can you have a net zero building if you're going to heat the water for a pool? How is that possible? Well, they've solved that. It's not going to be a four season pool. It'll be a three season or a, the right season pool. But there are other things that she found written into the document Quinton, that I had no idea. She said, it, you can't, uh, according, according to Lisa Peterson uh, in our net zero document, it says that uh, you can't use any carbon in the net zero buildings, no carbon source at all, even as an interim measure. And that's, that's problematic. So in the details of these documents and the document that I hope you will end up having in Concord, um, and elsewhere, you, you'll have people who are carefully looking at what, it, what does it mean? What does it mean to, uh, to build a net zero building? Uh, what does it mean to actually implement some of your recommendations? Um, we were really fortunate at the end of our 13-month process uh, with our biotech members on board, with our institutional members on board, with the citizens, uh, with the, uh, the experts from all sides, Everybody supported it. We had a little hiccup on the way. We have many labs in Cambridge, biotech labs, and the biotech lab developer was just, every time he came to the meeting, it was, his face was sour and sour. <laughs> She's gonna come to think, well, Joe. Oh, Joe is here now. What are we gonna do about Joe? But over time, and over listening really carefully uh, to what his concerns were, um, he was able, in the end, to support, uh, to support our Net Zero uh, Task Force's recommendation. So he, the, so the whole task force was unanimous, but in addition, uh, the Mass Biotech Council were a letter of support uh, for what we had done. And the Cambridge Compact for a Sustainable Future, which represents 25 of our largest building, building stock owners, also sent their support, along with that's the city council, and the city council was uh, so thrilled. They uh, they said, "Can't you do it faster?" and uh, and you must go out and tell everybody about it. So uh, so that's that's why we're here. So we're starting with our municipal buildings. We're starting with new construction. There are uh, several um, recommendations that already have been implemented, and I think maybe Quentin will tell you about those. We're already. Uh, rolling on and we feel that this is really possible. Uh, we feel you have to start with who you are and what emissions you have in your community. Understand that, uh, move forward from that, involve everybody and, um, and you, we will be thrilled to be working along with you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> so as Henry, I said about two years ago when <coughs> when MIT was proposing redevelopment in Kendall Square, a lot of us in the community, and you know, I'm an MIT alum, I love MIT, but, but we were definitely concerned that why are these not net zero? I mean, if, if MIT can't do it, you know, we're really in trouble. So, so we put a lot of pressure on, on MIT. I wrote a letter to the president of MIT, and we also uh, attempted in the city council to, to compel them to make those buildings net zero. But, but that didn't work. And so we ended up filing a citizen's petition, a zoning petition, that would require all large new buildings to be net zero, individually as 
as individual buildings. And, and as Henrietta pointed out, that caused a lot of concern in the community, which is, which is good because that got people's attention. And you know, when, when we started talking to people about going net zero uh, and about our petition, a lot of people said, well, you know, why didn't you come talk to us first? And we said, well, we probably wouldn't have gotten your attention that way. So, so we, we filed that petition in, in June 2013, and then there's a very specific progress over six months that has to be followed, inclu including city council hearings and planning board hearings and so on. And out of that process, then came this proposal to create a task force to really study uh, this, this zoning petition and, and how we could go net zero. And you know, there was legitimate criticism. Our petition only addressed new, large new construction because that's all we could get our hands on through the zoning mechanism. And uh, you know, there was, as, as Henrietta said, there was a genuine interest to actually look at the whole problem and, and all the buildings uh, in Cambridge. So we set up this, this website that you're seeing here on the screen, uh, netzerocambridge.org, and it's, it's still up. It has the whole history of our, our zoning petition. It has the original text on there. Please feel free to use that as a, as a resource in your own efforts you know, to see what, what we did and, of course, adapt it to your, own, to your own needs in your own community. So we went through the, the task force process, and. and one of the things that, that I was very insistent on was that if the task force was going to be a year, we should have some uh, early action out of the task force because I didn't want to just have us kick the can down the road another year. And, and the city manager agreed and, and he put that into the charter for the task force that there would be early recommendations. And one of the early actions was the building energy use disclosure ordinance that uh, Henrietta uh, mentioned, and for some reason it's not displaying now, but here it goes. Um, so, so this was passed, you know, so the task force recommended uh, very early on that we should uh, implement this, this ordinance. It was originally, there was one filed in Boston and, and Cambridge uh, filed a similar one shortly after. And this requires all the large new buildings all the large buildings, excuse me, in Cambridge to first report their energy use to the city. And then this year, for the first time, they will be required to disclose that energy use publicly. And there was actually a lot of support for this ordinance because a lot of the building owners in Cambridge actually want to showcase how efficient their buildings are. And so the city did a really great job working with the building owners to implement this this ordinance. So this this is a great way to get people thinking and going on you know how much energy is your building using and, and then what can you do to start reducing that. So after about a year and a half the um, task force came out with our final recommendations and that resulted in a 25 year action plan which was unanimously adopted by city council. And it's a, it's a very involved plan, as you can imagine, 25 years is a long time, so there's a lot, a lot of stuff to be done. The task force decided that we should revisit our action plan every five years. So we will reconvene of sorts every five years and review, you know, what have we accomplished and what has changed because the world changes very quickly and so some of these great ideas may not actually be the best idea anymore by the time we get to them. There, there's also specific milestones for different building types and you, you can't see that on there but by 2020 all municipal buildings in Cambridge that are new construction will be net zero and actually as Henrietta explained we're already doing that so, so the next school, the King Open School that we're about to start construction on is already being designed as a net zero building. So the city is going first and, and is making that commitment that we're only going to build net zero going forward. Um, for residential, the goal is 2022, which is actually, you know, that's coming up pretty quickly, um, but we don't have a, a whole lot of residential construction in Cambridge, so in some ways that's kind of easier. Um, 
And this is small residential, so this is one to three units, so individual homes. Um, multifamily and, and commercial buildings would be net zero by 2025. Again, this is new construction only. So 10 years from now, if you're building something in Cambridge, it's gonna be net zero. And then last but not least are the um, bio labs, and, and we have a lot of those in Cambridge, and they are supposed to be net zero by 2030, again, new construction. And as Henry has said, there, there was a lot of consternation around that, and I happened to, to run a biotech company for seven years, and so I was intimately familiar with both the challenges of being energy efficient in a bio lab and with the Mass Biotech Council, as it happens, because I was a member. So I actually went to meet with them, and you know, they said, well, we don't think we can get to net zero by 2030. And I said, if we can't get you 100% renewable electricity by 2030 that is cheaper than conventional electricity, we have much bigger problems than whether your labs are net zero or not. And, and I think that gave them comfort that maybe they could agree to this milestone. So the, the very first um, new recommendation that came out of the task force, which was also in our original zoning petition, is to increase the uh, green building to lead gold plus some energy points. And this is really important to start with energy reduction, right? So when you build a new building, make it as efficient as possible so that you don't have to get so much energy from renewable sources in the first place. So the, the city staff is actually working right now on writing that ordinance, and we're very optimistic that we'll get that through city council in this, in this year. And so all large new construction in Cambridge after that ordinance passes will be lead gold. And it's instructional to note that a lot of large new buildings in Cambridge already today are being constructed lead gold because the, that knowledge is growing so quickly and that practice among architects and, and builders is growing so quickly. In fact, at the city council hearing when we adopted the net zero action plan, uh, one of the councilors, Councilor Benzin, asked if there were any architects in the room who wished to speak on what the impact would be on their profession if we required all new buildings to be, all large new buildings to be lead gold. And three architects spoke all in favor. So, you know, oftentimes we assume that, oh, there'll be all this resistance and people not ready, but it turns out that sometimes the, the professionals are, they're already there. <laughs> and really we're just giving them uh, some extra support. Um, one of the next things that, that we were very clear on in the, in the task force was to work on a solar ready requirement. This will be a few years out, um, but the idea is that all the new buildings would be required to be ready for solar. Now, of course, this only applies if, in fact, they can have solar, but a lot of the buildings are, you know, they're tall, so they stick out above everything else. There's not a lot of shading issues. And they tend to have flat roofs, which can usually have solar. So it would just require that the, the building is constructed so it can handle the load uh, physically and also that the electronics are uh, put in place in the, in the right way so that it's very easy to add solar on top of the building. And then a few years after that, we would go to a solar requirement uh, ordinance. So all large new buildings would then be required to have solar. Um, so, so those are some of the, the um, plans that would address new construction. Now, it's very important also to keep in mind that, in, for example, in Cambridge, about 1% of our building stock at any time is new construction. So 99% is already there. And that's much more difficult to address. And you know, when, when we give these talks, people very quickly say, oh, you know, but how do we get to these multifamily homes? And you know, it's really hard. And we, we don't have the perfect answers. But we did have a lot of ideas around um, this carbon fund that, that Henry has spoke about. And you know, we're, we're gonna continue to explore that with um, Harvard and MIT to see if they can help us develop that into a real 
um, offset mechanism where we have some more control over it because it's local. And so it, it, people tend to trust that more than, you know, okay, you're buying some forest far away, but how do we know that's really happening? And then there's, there's a lot of state programs, of course, that help us address uh, existing buildings that we need to take more advantage of. So the, the city of Cambridge, this, this year and last year, we are competing in the Georgetown Energy Prize, um, which is a $5 million prize for the city that reduces their energy consumption the most. And one of the main things that we're doing there is going into the community and telling people about these great energy efficiency programs that are available to them. You know, it's free money. You'd be amazed at how difficult it is to convince people to, to take advantage of those. Um, so as part of the, the outreach, the, um, the city did design this, this wonderful infographic, which I'll make it a little smaller so you can actually see it, um, that Henrietta was handing out as well. And I want to draw your attention to the, the step number four on the right there, which talks about our energy supply. And what the consultants did was they looked at, you know, how much energy are we consuming in total, or, you know, how many emissions are we generating, and then how much could we reasonably reduce that over the next 25 years. And so that's the top line, and you can see the energy use, and so the emissions are going down as we improve our efficiency. But in the bottom, that yellow wedge is actually the renewable portfolio standard, which is a, a state law that requires the utilities to increase the amount of renewable electricity on the grid by 1% every year. And so we're getting a large contribution just from the RPS, right? Just being connected to the grid. So what I want you to do is imagine if, if we, in the next few years, doubled that requirement from 1% to 2%, that yellow wedge would suddenly play a much bigger, bigger role in our ability to get to zero. So it's very important to address that supply uh, issue because, you know, as, as we talked about, people very quickly jumped to the conclusion that we were asking all individual buildings to produce their own energy. And, and we're not asking for that because we can't do that. So we're going to be dependent on the grid to ultimately deliver most of that renewable electricity to us. And so it's very important to advocate for that. And, and that was, again, one of the recommendations from the task force was actually for the city to support um, our legislators asking for an increase to the renewable portfolio standard. Um, right now, we're, we're having big arguments in the state houses, you may know, about solar net metering in Massachusetts and also about our energy supply in general and whether we should get a lot of energy from, from hydro in, in Canada, whether we should build new pipelines. So these are really important issues that we all need to be addressing as well because it impacts how well we can do in our cities in terms of reducing our, our energy supply uh, and our emissions. So I can't really express how grateful, I mean, I can try. I'm so, <laughs> gra so grateful uh, for Quentin and Henrietta to be here today because I don't know if you've heard, but Concord Mothers Out Front has a net zero warrant article coming up at town meeting. Um, we've been doing a lot of promotion of this discussion and this idea, but it's absolutely so helpful um, to hear Cambridge's example and to have them here for the question answer session. Um, which we'll go into just uh, just a minute. The one thing that I wanted to mention is that, well, maybe I should say, for those of you who don't know about Mother's Health Front, who we are. Um, I'm part of the uh, community organizing team of Mother's Out Front. Um, a bunch of us are here. And some of us have our little uniform on with our black t-shirt. And basically, Mother's Out Front is active across Massachusetts um, and now in two new states, uh, New York and Virginia because we just can't stay silent about the very real harm being caused by our society's dependence on fossil fuels 
And so all over, we are taking action both in our personal lives and politically. Um, before we go to the Q&A, I just wanted to say that for those of you interested in more information about our, our warrant article, which goes after the three main components that Henrietta um, and Quinton have been talking about, the establishment of net zero goals that are appropriate for our community, the establishment of a task force across diverse groups in the community to think and work together on these issues, and also funding for the consultants to help with facilitation and also with their technical expertise.